now here's a favorite I've been wanting to cover for ages. This is Star Wars Episode I Racer, developed and published by LucasArts in May of 1999 for Windows PCs, alongside the Nintendo 64 release which is probably the more well-known version of the game. It also got released for the Macintosh and the Sega Dreamcast the following year, along with a highly simplified Game Boy Color version, and even a beefy coin-op arcade machine with proper pod racing controls. But for this video I'm going to be sticking to this PC version since it's the one I owned and played back then and I just like it. Although I vividly remember the first time I saw the game at all, which was at the local Best Buy store where they had an N64 demo unit hooked up to this massive 3x3 display of some kind hanging from the ceiling, I was instantly enamored with the game, and the moment we upgraded our PC to be able to play 3D accelerated games, this Windows version with its gorgeous gatefold box was on my short list of most wanted titles. Although I don't recall if this limited edition box is the one we got back then or not, but hey, it's the one I have now, so let's take a look. Turns out there were two covers released, one with Anakin's Pod Racer and one with Sebulba, with the latter being much more uncommon, but neither are particularly cheap boxes these days. Contained within is a colorful smorgasbord of late 90s PC game inserts, including the limited edition goodies like this aesthetically appealing pod racer schematic and the less than appealing young Anakin Skywalker poster. Eh, it could have been worse. You also get this wonderful Spring 99 LucasArts catalog, and man I love looking through these. This was quite a busy time for the company, with prequel trilogy hype reaching a fever pitch and new games coming out seemingly every other month. And of course you get the game on a single compact disc in a jewel case, as well as the full color owner's manual with 37 pages of full color manual that is yours to own. And even for 1999, this is a fantastic little booklet filled with great concept art, useful illustrations, and copious well-written tidbits detailing each facet of gameplay. I just love a good bathroom break booklet. Starting up the game provides you with an assortment of animated LucasArts artistry in the form of logos and introductory cutscenes, with the main one showing a loose recreation of Episode 1's famous pod racing scene. We are then presented with the main menu screen, John Williams' classic Duel of the Fates playing on an endless loop. At this point you can choose to play multiplayer, a single race, or the tournament mode. And we'll just be looking at tournament mode in this video because single race simply allows access to stuff unlocked in tournament mode, and multiplayer requires a direct connection to other PCs through a local area network. Sadly, you do not get split-screen multiplayer goodness in this version like you did on the consoles, and that always kind of bummed me out. What you do get is the ability to create a profile for yourself and then watch a short in-game cutscene where you wander into this cantina, shoo away whatever randomly chosen droid or creature happens to be standing in your way, and then selecting a pod racer. Each of them have seven performance statistics inherent to their vehicle, as well as an eighth statistic that's a little more vague and that is the size and shape of the pod racer itself. The driver really is of no consequence, but you do get to choose from everyone shown in Episode 1's pod racing scene and plenty more, with over 20 drivers unlockable by the end of the game. Finally, you can select from and compete in one of three tournaments with up to seven races each, with the goal being to place fourth or better on each track to reach the final competition, the Bunta Eve Classic from the movie. After this, you're presented with a management screen, allowing you to begin the selected race, inspect your pod racer for no reason other than to admire the polygons and graphics, and perform a number of pod racer upgrades and tweaks. We'll be back to this in a moment, but for now, let's drop right into the pod racing itself, beginning with another cutscene introducing you to the upcoming planet. Welcome, pod racing fans, to Ando Prime, home of the benevolent Andobi Bindu monks. Your host, the wisest of the wise, Ten Abu Donba. The track favorite is Aldar Beater, aka the Hitman. Oh boy, he sure looks tough with that big, magic Ram Air R4 pod racer of his. Now 
Now this is Pod Racing, or this is Episode 1 Racer, to be more precise. Did anyone actually call it by its proper marketed title back then? I know my friends and I always called it Star Wars Pod Racer, but anyway. The gameplay is precisely what you'd expect for an experience based on the nearly 20 minute scene from Episode 1, absurdly fast racing through sci-fi environments with excellent sound design interrupted by the occasional piece of grating dialogue. And man, this is still a lot of fun. One of the most important things for a racing game to get right is the sense of speed, and Episode 1 Racer is one that absolutely nails that. If the speed of the simulation was too slow, it risks breaking the suspension of disbelief knowing that these pod racers are moving at velocities exceeding 600 miles an hour. But if the simulation were to move too fast, or even moved at a speed that was more accurate to what it would be in reality, then the game would simply be unplayable. You must have Jedi reflexes if you race pods may be true, but expecting every gamer to possess those would not be very enjoyable. Thankfully, the combination of the environments, sound effects, graphical effects, and control scheme make approaching 1,000 miles an hour here not only feasible, but desirable. The controls in particular are something to be commended here because it gives you just enough options to be able to fully control your pod without ever feeling like the room for error disappears. And seeing as they made this work as well as it does, even on a keyboard, that's impressive. Now you might want an analog control method of some kind, whether it be a joystick, a gamepad, a steering wheel, or even the mouse, but personally, I've always just played this version of the game with the keyboard because, well, I got used to it back in the day, but also because I find the precise digital controls spread across the keyboard to be a good match for this kind of twitchy racing. And the manner in which LucasArts split up the required inputs by default cleverly avoids the problem of ghosting when you're pressing multiple keys simultaneously on a keyboard without NKRO. On the right-hand side of the keyboard, you use the arrow keys to turn left and right, as well as pitch up and down. And on the left-hand side, you have the WASD keys for controlling thrust, brakes, and the somewhat superfluous rolling left and right. There are also keys on the left side for performing repairs, changing cameras, taunting, as well as the all-important slide key. When this is held down, your pod racer goes from rapidly strafing left and right to having a more nuanced and fine-tuned control scheme that's better suited for navigating sharp corners and narrow passageways. And finally, there's the boost mode, enabled by pressing a combination of inputs. Whenever you've maxed out on speed and this indicator turns from green to yellow, you can pitch down and press shift to enable the boost, which will take you well beyond your normal thrust speed at the expense of handling and heat generation. And that's where this indicator on the bottom left of the screen comes into play, showing your engine status alongside an audio cue letting you know you're about to overheat. If you push too far, then an engine will catch fire and you will need repairing on the fly, and if you keep pushing, you'll explode, so balancing thrust with boost is key. Before long, though, this becomes a second nature and you don't even need to look at any of the indicators at all, relying completely on the audio cues and timing to make sure you're going as fast as possible in your current pod racer without combusting. Of course, if you do explode, then you're quickly reset with fresh engines, but obviously that's not ideal since you lose valuable time. And parts do wear out the more you screw up as well, so you will have to perform repairs once you complete the race. This is not something that you do manually, it just gets fixed up over time by your pit droids, so buying up as many of those as you can, as quickly as you can, is very much advised. And since it takes time to fix a pod racer, at this point you just switch to another one and keep playing. Because the way things work in tournament mode is that you play more of a manager for every pod racer rather than a single racer themselves. Once you've chosen a racer, you can then invest your credits into improving their pod racer through parts upgrades with everyone sharing the same pool of credits, or you can swap between them at will depending on your repair needs. You also have the option to simply switch out any damaged parts for others that are in better shape or have different stats altogether. Entering Watto's shop or junkyard will provide dozens of parts options covering all of the performance categories of your pod racer, and this certainly isn't the most streamlined process. There's a lot of menu interface weirdness that makes it feel clunky with a mouse, and I wish there was more of an overview of all the available parts at once instead of having to navigate through each one individually to see what it does. And I also wish Watto would just shut up already. I am a betting heavily on Sebulba. He always wins! <laughs>
Seriously, he never stops. It's just an endless loop of the same annoying sound bites over and over. Have you seen uh, my chance cube? Have you seen uh, my chance cube? Have you seen uh, my chance cube? Okay, how about those visuals though? Hmm, 1999, I kind of miss this era in PC game graphics. Although admittedly this particular footage doesn't look great anymore since I'm running it at 640x480, which is the resolution I played it on back when it was new, and the HUD elements look distractingly blurry, a problem that unfortunately exists no matter what resolution you choose. But oh well, it gets the job done. And did anybody else ever see this 3 as the Monster Energy logo? Well, now I'm just getting distracted. Anyway, what I'm trying to say here is that while technically it's not amazing anymore, in terms of aesthetics for a decades-old game, I think it still looks pretty great, all things considered. Star Wars design language and color palettes mesh perfectly with late 90s graphical capability, I feel. The 3D models are just polygonal enough to be believable, and the textures are just detailed enough to look good at high speeds. I also like how most of the alternate routes and shortcuts are clearly laid out on the mini-map, and man, there are a bunch of them. Finding and mastering the shortest and most navigable bits of track is key to a first place finish and a new lap record! And then there are the environmental effects like snow, dust, water, lens flares, and all sorts of objects breaking apart on collision that looked positively fantastic back then and remain enjoyably charming now. I especially love the design of the tracks that take place on worlds filled with neon and rusty metal everywhere, and the mining stations with zero gravity sections where you're flying past floating rocks and electrical hazards. Tracks like these make your choice in Podracer quite significant, since a larger but faster pod might be too difficult to navigate compared to a slower but smaller one. In fact, the hazards are the other main pillar of the gameplay here, with each track and permutation of said track containing its own unique props, pitfalls, and perilous problems to plow through or pilot past. Though I always found it odd that pod racers slip and slide while going over icy surfaces, since well, they're not actually touching the ground, right? The game itself says you're hovering four feet off the ground in these things, so why is I slippery? Oh well, it's one more tricky thing to navigate, and I dig it nonetheless. Once you finish that, you're crowned the king of pods or something, and the credits roll, and all that remains are the additional challenge tracks. I actually enjoy most of them, but uh, there's this one in particular, Abyss. It is by far the worst in the game. Visually, I like it, but it is poorly, unfairly designed. It's the only track in the game that harshly punishes you for not taking the exact correct route. So unless you take this top portion of the track every lap, you have zero chance of winning due to it forcing you down a long, out-of-the-way loop of track that puts you way behind. And due to the nature of this top portion of track, it's incredibly easy to fall off either side. Not only that, but it is oddly buggy, with your pod just blowing up on certain sections of each turn. Quite simply, I hate this track and everything about it, and after about 40 minutes of trying to attain a podium finish, I said screw it and gave up. I ain't got nothing to prove, this track can suck it. And lastly, there are perks of this particular version running on Windows. If you're used to the much more limited N64 version, it's awesome to see that it's capable of running up to 60 frames per second on PC, even on period-correct hardware like this Pentium 3-based system with a 16MB Voodoo 3 graphics card that I'm using here. There are definitely some tracks that play way smoother than others, but overall it's a wonderful experience on PC. I mean, if you can get it working. I've experienced an array of bugs, graphical glitches, sound system problems, and compatibility issues over the years, and that's just on Windows 98. On a modern system, it can be a true test of patience to get it working 100%. Thankfully, GOG.com has recently re-released the game on PC, and it works fantastically right out of the gate, at least in my experience so far. Not only that, but you can crank the resolution up as high as your display provides. So yeah, you want this in 1440p or 4K or whatever, go for it. It'll still be 4x3 aspect ratio, but it looks awesome. So if you want to revisit the game on a newer PC, I would highly recommend this version just for ease of use. And if you'd like to support this channel at the same time, feel free to check out my affiliate link to GOG below this video. Either way, though, I was happy to find that Star Wars Episode One Racer holds up incredibly well, even after having not played it for at least 10 years. I'm sure some of that has to do with my own memories of the game from when it was new and just playing it a crapload and beating it, but I also truly think that it stands out even today as one of the more satisfying and speedy sci-fi racers of the late 1990s. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that was fun to make. I hope this video was fun to watch. Either way, though, as always, I thank you very much for watching.